Thank you, Annelieke, first of all, for the uh, invitation. It's a pleasure, of course, to tell something about a subject you care about a lot. And in preparing this lecture, I think I have had in mind an audience that probably consists of international people who might know something about law, but not so much about the Dutch constitution, or Dutch people who also uh, don't know much about law or don't study law and might be interested in hearing a little bit more about the constitution. But please, if at any point I'm going too fast or maybe also too slow, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, and then I will talk about 15 minutes, I guess, uh, but definitely also will leave some room for questions at the end. So that um, before I get started. So the topic of today is the Dutch constitution. And I, of course, needed uh, a way of, of introducing this topic. Recently, the Dutch constitution has been quite a bit in the news, in the sense that we have a new government, that we have a government that sometimes tries to sort of find uh, the, the outer possibilities of what the constitution allows for, uh, that does not always uh, seem to take the procedures of the constitution um, uh, extremely seriously and that means also that in politics in media uh, we are talking currently about the constitution and sometimes i'm asked to reflect on these developments so is this allowed by the constitution or what what does the constitution require what is actually the role of our dutch constitution and i found myself saying multiple things so on the one hand the constitution is a set of basic rules that must be complied with at all times. But also, I have argued and written that the Constitution, the Dutch Constitution, is merely a pretty open invitation to good politics. Now, the question is, can this both be true? Can this be a set of rules, but also a more open invitation to politics? And I will argue that it is, and that that's also one of the specifics of the Dutch constitution that make it somewhat different uh, than your average constitution. So let me first uh, say briefly what I will uh, be doing uh, the uh, next uh, about 50 minutes. I will start very briefly with uh, saying something about the constitution. What is a constitution? What is it for? Uh, how have constitutions uh, developed uh, throughout uh, the centuries? And then I will move particularly to the Dutch constitution. And one of the uh, things the Dutch constitution is famous for is that it's one of the oldest constitutions in the world. Uh, also, and the two things hang together, I think, a little bit, um, the constitution is quite sober in the Netherlands. We don't have a constitution with a big preamble and a lot of symbolic <coughs> messages in it. That's also something that is typical for the Dutch constitution. But I will quickly also move from the historical development to today, because I think the most interesting questions uh, are uh, lying uh, right before us. And then I will uh, take uh, more or less five topics as a starting point to introduce the constitution to you a bit further. And when discussing these topics, I will also um, say a little bit about current developments or maybe plans to change the constitution and what we could think about that. So these topics are, first of all, uh, the issue of representation, so political representation. What does the constitution say about that? And what's about all these kings mentioned in our constitution. What's the role of the king? Torbeck's house refers to our sort of multi-layered uh, state with provinces and municipalities. Uh, then I will move to the topic of constitutional review, or in fact, the Dutch constitution's prohibition of constitutional review, uh, which is also quite a typical feature. I will uh, make sure I explain that uh, in more detail, and I end 
uh, with some remarks on the role and function of fundamental rights in the Dutch constitution. But first, so what are constitutions for? We can see if we look at the past couple, couple of uh, centuries that actually there's a huge growth in the number of constitutions. And especially uh, the past few decades, uh, a lot of uh, constitutions have been added to the world catalog of, of constitutions. There's meanwhile also uh, a big repository where you can find all these constitutions and compare constitutions and really uh, look for similarities and differences. It's all in the English language. Uh, so that's a great source also for, uh, for researchers. Uh, but most countries these days have a constitution, have a written constitution. And we can ask, what are these constitutions for? What are these constitutions in the first place? Now, I have to refer uh, in this respect to my Leiden colleague, uh, Wim Voermans, who has written an important work on this topic. I have the Dutch version here, uh, but there is now also an English version out with Cambridge University Press 2023, and it's called The Story of Constitutions. So Wim Voermans actually moving beyond a more legal analysis of what is in this document and what does it mean in a legal way also tries to figure out what, what the constitution from a more, well, societal, uh, uh, historical uh, perspective is. And he looks at the nature of humans and how we live together, how we organize ourselves and how constitutions have come to play a role in this organization. So actually one of the main points of, of the book and of the history of the story of constitutions is that on the one hand, constitutions provide us with a common narrative, right? Uh, uh, an imagined world and an imagined community, especially if we move beyond the small groups of trust, like within a family or a small village, where we actually know each other and can trust each other on that basis. So constitutions allow for bigger groups of people, states, peoples, to live together and to cooperate, successfully cooperate with one another. Now, maybe one point of, of, of clarification also. In the legal studies on, on constitutions, we make a difference between what we sometimes call small C constitutions and large C constitutions. So with large C constitutions, we mean the actual written documents that most states have and call their constitution. Maybe you know of an example uh, of a country that does not have a written constitution, the United Kingdom. It does have a constitution, but it's not written. Um, apart from these big C constitutions, so the written documents, constitutional norms can also be found in other laws and, and regulations. So also in the Netherlands, we have a number of other laws uh, that hold constitutional norms, think we, uh, things we consider uh, to be of constitutional relevance that could be considered the, the uh, small C constitution, so constitution not with a capital C. And then there's also, and this is also a typical feature of the Dutch constitution, there is unwritten constitutional norms, not everything we find important, even some of the things that are central to our parliamentary democracy is written down in the constitution. And there's also a reason for that, and I will get to that. So in brief, if I would have to summarize what a constitution does, it's a sort of two-sided thing. On the one hand, it lays down all the competences that the state, organs of the state, uh, the government, judges have. So there's no competence, no state power without it being some way connected to the constitution. And the idea, of course, behind that is that we as persons are originally free. It took us some time in history to realize that and to find that out that we're all equal and we're all free. But that means that the power exercised upon us by a government, by a state, must also be based on, on something. And something that was actually 
indeed also created by us, by ourselves, by the peoples that have written the constitutions. So there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, articles in the constitution, in constitutions generally, that provide us with the competences of the state. And we can ask, for example, in front of courts, whether the state has moved beyond these competences. And that's the other side of the coin indeed. The constitution not only limits the competences, but also the limits we have there too. So, of course, some competences are phrased quite broadly in the sense that there is a general competence for the legislator consisting of the houses of parliament uh, together with the government to make laws. But of course, these laws must be in compliance with fundamental rights constitutional rights, such as the right to freedom of expression, freedom of religion, uh, the right to vote, the right to private life, um, etc. So these rights, I think, are, are probably the most important example of the limitations the Constitution provides to the competences it uh, shapes as well. Now, in the Dutch uh, literature on, on our Constitution, there's also another way of looking at uh, the various functions uh, a, constitutional, a constitution has or our constitution has. So indeed it has a legal function, right? It clarifies what is allowed and what is not allowed. It provides for legal rules. However, our Dutch constitution, sometimes you have to divide them up a little bit in constitutions that are more legal and legally enforced or more political and politically enforced, and if we would do that, then the Dutch constitution definitely is an example of a constitution that is more political and politically enforced. Again, this has to do, and again, I will get to that in more detail, with the fact that courts are not allowed in the Netherlands to review whether acts of parliament are in line with the constitution. So they have to be but it's not for the courts to judge upon that. And that's also maybe part of the answer already to the point I was making at the beginning, that the Dutch constitution is not simply always a set of super clear rules we have to comply with. It's also an invitation to good lawmaking, to good politics, to decent uh, politics. And that's also one of the things uh, we have to keep in mind uh, when we look at changing political circumstances, does the constitution then still provide uh, enough guidance? And maybe should it be legally enforceable after all? Because I think, uh, and I think uh, we, we can argue that, that uh, because our constitution is relatively open to uh, the political actors, uh, it also means we have to rely on these political actors dealing with the Constitution and dealing with this invitation and this freedom in a uh, justified way. So the political stabilizing function can probably be a little bit departed from that in the sense that it mostly relates to the fact that the Constitution lays down our political system, right? How about representation? What is the role of the parliament? How does it function? Uh, how is a new parliament enacted? And how do we get a new government? So there's all these rules that make sure we have a system. We have a system of power, and we also have a transition of power from time to time. Right? You probably all remember uh, what happened last week in the US, and the fact also that uh, Kamala Harris, I remember, of course, uh, said um, uh, briefly after... Trump was seen to win the elections, that she will stick to the Constitution and will allow for a peaceful transition of power. So the Constitution lays down the ground rules for our system, how to deal with power, and also how we can influence that power. Just a, a brief look back uh, at the history of the Dutch Constitution. So, as I've said, the Dutch constitution is considered to be one of the oldest in the world. There is a little bit of discussion about whether 
uh, our first constitution dates from 1814 or 15. There was a new version in 1815, and there's debate among scholars and others about whether this 1815 constitution was actually the same constitution as 1814, but with some new elements, or that it was a new constitution. Because if we look at how old the constitution is, we look at how long it has been into place, right, as it is. There's countries that have had constitutions before, but that probably made a new constitution somewhere uh, uh, along the way, uh, maybe only a couple of decades ago. But generally, it is seen that the Dutch constitution really dates back to 1814 and 15, even though we have had a few moments in time with some big uh, reforms. Also, before the first constitutions, we had rules, right, that can be seen, in hindsight at least, as predecessors of modern constitutions. For example, we can look at the Treaty of the Union of Utrecht, 1579 already, which already had some basic freedoms, such as the freedom of conscience. So you can already recognize that there is, well, an idea of, of individual rights, of individual rights that must be drawn up in order to ensure that these rights are uh, respected uh, also uh, against uh, the powers uh, currently in place. Also, the Batavian Republic and the Bataafse Staatregeling uh, from 1789 can be considered a predecessor of our modern constitution. And then when the Kingdom of the Netherlands uh, came into being after the time of, of Napoleon, with our first King William uh, I, um, the first constitution um, was developed. So during the 19th century, uh, of course, there has been a lot of upheaval. Now, what the Netherlands is, is uh, known for in this respect is that we did not have a big revolution as in other countries. There were some upheavals in the big cities, uh, but uh, in 1848, we, in the end, got a new constitution with a parliamentary system that gave more power, indeed, to the people, uh, but it, without um, there being a big constitution that uh, made this uh, necessary. And that's the constitution we often refer to as the Constitution of Torbecke. I don't know if you recall, but last year we celebrated 175 years of the Dutch constitution, the Constitution of Torbecke, and that was a great event and a great reason to have a lot of uh, events and, and discussions uh, about our constitution. But at the same time, I always thought, yeah, but you know, actually the constitution is even older. Um, however, indeed, uh, the constitution of uh, 1848 provided for a number of very important uh, reforms. So our Dutch parliamentary system was grounded as well as the idea of ministerial responsibility and the limits, indeed, to the power of the king. Right before that time, uh, kings were uh, quite uh, absolute or their power was quite absolute uh, and it slowly became clearer that, indeed, also the constitution must provide for a system of democracy. Well, not, not full democracy, but power of bigger groups of people and the responsibility, indeed, of ministers in case something went wrong. And this is also where our famous Dutch rule of trust, the vertrouwensregel, maybe you've heard about it, uh, came into being. And that means that the government can only govern as long as it has the trust of the parliament. If the parliament no longer trusts a minister of the, or the, the government in its entirety, the government can fall and we need new elections. So the ways in which you could vote were indeed dependent um, then still uh, on, on the basis of your uh, taxes you paid and how rich you were. Um, and also in the 1848 constitution, we had a, an increased number of rights. Since then, I think we can really say we still have the same constitution, but there have been, of course, reforms. There has been uh, the female suffrage. Uh, there have been um, also changes to the constitution that allowed 
for some mention of the international legal order that developed throughout the 20th century. Um, uh, and also, in terms of fundamental rights, there have been small changes occurring. However, only in 1983, we had another big reform of the Constitution. We call it a general reform of the Constitution in the sense that it was completely rewritten, reshuffled. For example, all the fundamental rights that were found throughout the document were then placed in the first chapter of the Constitution at the outset. And that is actually still the Constitution that looks like uh, the Constitution we have today. Also, which was important uh, around 1983, is that the Dutch Constitution got some social rights. Now, we'll get to the point of fundamental rights, but generally we make a difference between classical, political fundamental rights and freedoms, such as the freedom of expression, of religion, the right to vote, the right to demonstrate, which first and foremost require the state to, you know, to stay out of our lives to some extent. They uh, ensure our individual freedom, more or less a space of individual freedom where the state is not allowed to enter in. Right? That's the original idea of fundamental rights, of fundamental freedoms that came up uh, throughout history as a way of protecting a personal space against strong governments. Uh, but when we moved from a, a very liberal uh, idea of the state that mostly took care of, I don't know, infrastructure or, or the army towards the more social understanding of the state that actually had to provide us also with some things. Think of education, think of care, think of housing. Uh, meanwhile, we also require the state to provide for a clean environment uh, to some extent. That has been translated uh, also into the Constitution in the sense that we now also have social rights in the Constitution. Rights to housing indeed, health care, work, uh, social security, uh, a healthy environment, it's, it's phrased differently, um, but a good environment. Um, and indeed also education. So that's one of the most uh, uh, important changes also that came about in 1983. But let's move to uh, the current day and the relevance also of the Constitution today. So today the Constitution, I don't know if you have an image of it. This is like one of the law books, textbooks, law texts that we give students. They have two of them. For those of you who are no lawyers here in the room, how much of you think is this is the Constitution? Well, I, I think I already provided the answer a little bit, but the Constitution really is just, okay, it's small uh, typos, but um, the Constitution really only, you know, well, is, is like this. This, this is all, this is the Constitution. Uh, also doesn't mean that all the other laws are in here as well, right? It's the most important laws and we have a second volume as well. But the Constitution really, it's just 142 articles divided up into eight chapters. And I listed uh, the chapters there as well. So we start out with the fundamental rights. And then we move also a bit along the different powers of government. Right, you know, one of the most important aspects and principles of the idea of the rule of law. Uh, it's also coming up in, uh, in, in politics and, and public debate relatively often at the moment. The rule of law is the idea that the government is always basing itself on the law, that it has no powers without these being based on the law. But it also means that this power is not uh, centralized in one hand only. We have a division of power. So on the one hand, we have the uh, parliament that makes the laws together with the government. Uh, we, we have the government and the executive that actually make sure these laws are translated into practice, practice and, for example, lead to uh, individual outcomes or an individual uh, letter from the government that you get a certain social benefit or not. And then we have the judiciary that in the end can control whether um, uh, the government uh, 
stuck uh, to the law. Um, so these powers also can be seen uh, back in these uh, different um, chapters of the, of the Dutch constitution. Uh, we have the states general, right? The Staten Generaal, the uh, first and second house of parliament, uh, the council of state and other advisory bodies, the legislation, administration, so the executive part, and the administration of justice, which is indeed chapter six, which deals with uh, how courts are set up uh, um, and uh, what uh, uh, rules courts should stick to. Um, then we have a chapter about provinces, municipalities, the Caribbean public bodies, of course, uh, but also water authorities. It's also quite Dutch, I guess, and other public bodies. And in the end, there are rules for how to revise the constitution. Now, also since 1983, there have been changes to the constitution. Uh, some minor changes. Uh, I think uh, we had still some quite old-fashioned language also in our Bill of Rights. Uh, there was, for example, in the, the right um, to freedom of uh, communication, I think there was still a uh, reference to the telegraaf, uh, and, and, and I don't even know what's the English term um, to be used, but uh, at least the communication devices that were mentioned in the constitutions were such that uh, none of us uh, has actually uh, ever uh, used these, um, and that's some of the changes that have been made. But also in Article 1 of the constitution, which provides for um, the prohibition of discrimination, and I can briefly read it out in my uh, Dutch version, or uh, English version. All persons in the Netherlands shall be treated equally in equal circumstances, discrimination on the grounds of religion, belief, political opinion, race or sex, or any grounds whatsoever shall not be permitted. So recently to these grounds of non-discrimination, grounds on which you cannot be discriminated, um, two grounds were added. Uh, I think it was sexual orientation and handicap. Uh, so you see there, there are still some tweaks here and there to our constitution. And one big thing, well, at least in a symbolic way, maybe because the legal effect of this uh, addition is not too big, I, I would argue, um, a new general provision. I've already told you that our constitution is pretty sober. We do not start out with the preamble that says, we the people and the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and all kinds of uh, pretty words. We don't do that. And we're also a little bit proud of that to some extent. Um, however, uh, there was a need, a felt need for at least some message to start out with. And of course, this has led to quite some debate. I will tell you how the constitution can be changed um, uh, in a bit. Uh, and in the end, they agreed on, on the following formulation. The grondwet waarborgt de grondrechten en de democratische rechtsstaat. So the constitution guarantees the fundamental rights as well as the democratic rule of law. So this raises a lot of questions. For example, okay, so the constitution does so, so who else needs to do anything? Uh, if the constitution doesn't do so, uh, is it then violated? So, for example, if a new government would actually scrap some fundamental rights from our constitution, could that then be a violation of this general provision? Well, there's some open-ended questions. I would argue also, for example, that fundamental rights are an inherent part of the democratic rule of law so that they should not necessarily have to be mentioned separately. Uh, but that's maybe uh, more for legal insiders. Uh, however, we have some uh, symbolism now in our constitution. So regular changes, but the fact that these changes still re remain minor and that some things that we might want to change are very hard to change, it really has to do with the fact that we have a rigid constitution, right? We make a difference maybe if we look at constitutions worldwide between those that are more flexible and that can be changed maybe with a simple majority and those that are 
more rigid, harder to change. And the Dutch constitution definitely is an example of the latter. So we do not have, unlike, for example, the German constitution, an eternity clause, right? The German constitution, a new constitution, 1949, after the Second World War, has a clause that says these and these and these and these articles can never be changed, period. We don't have that. However, our constitution can only be changed in two readings, we call it. It's, it's written down in Article uh, uh, 137 of the Constitution, and that means that there has to be a proposal to change the Constitution that is uh, agreed upon by the majority of the Parliament, by both houses. So the Second Chamber and the First Chamber have to agree on the proposal. And then after elections, so after the period of, of the second chamber ends and there's a new parliament, there has to be another vote. And in the second vote, you have to have a two-thirds majority. And these must be also consecutive periods uh, of, of legislation. So you cannot, uh, which has happened before, so now they clarified this in the constitution, you cannot have a majority for a proposal to change the constitution, let's say add a new ground of discrimination, then you have a different government and a different makeup of the parliament and you think, nah, this time uh, it won't work. They're not going to vote in favor of it. Let's, let's wait for another uh, period with another parliament that might be uh, more in favor of this proposal. That, that's not possible. You need to have continuous support and indeed two-thirds two uh, of both parliaments uh, in the second round that actually agrees with such a proposal. And this is one of the reasons why the whole idea of courts not being allowed to test, to control, to review whether formal acts of parliament are in line with the constitution or not, still hasn't been changed, right? We have tried, and actually it makes sense to change this, but still we didn't manage uh, to do so. So, yeah, is this constitution alive and uh, kicking? Uh, I do think, um, especially also compared to some 10 years ago when I uh, uh, finished my PhD and I wrote my PhD on uh, more international and European human rights standards. And as soon as we discussed fundamental rights in the Netherlands, we looked at the European Convention or other international norms because our constitution and the fact that courts did not review on the basis of the constitution, which means we don't have a lot of judgments, right? Case law about the constitution. Back then, we really didn't talk much about the constitution. This has changed, and this has changed, I guess, mostly due to political and other developments, right? In times of the corona crisis, uh, there has been more talk about fundamental rights. All of our fundamental rights have been interfered with, right? And um, there was also more discussion about the Constitution and whether or not the Constitution should protect us better or at least be relevant in this context. We have seen the kinderopvang toeslagen affaire, the child care benefit scandal, which has also raised questions about what are our protecting norms here in the Netherlands and what is the role of courts. Also, again, more discussion about the Constitution. And then, of course, uh, right now we also see a uh, political playing field in which the, the borders of what is constitutionally al allowed and what fundamental rights require or not uh, are, are uh, constantly sort of uh, approached. Only today, right, uh, to uh, underline the, the relevance of this topic, we have seen a court geding, a judicial procedure about the prohibition to demonstrate in Amsterdam. And the court argued that rather than at the Stopera, at the, municipal, uh, at the municipality, they were only allowed, indeed, as the uh, mayor uh, had said, somewhere else. But also, uh, milieu defense lost from Shell. So we had a fundamental rights case that actually said even a company can be held accountable for not doing enough to... Uh, uh, reduce uh, climate uh, change uh, risks. 
And the court now, in second instance, uh, has argued um, that uh, this cannot be expected, or at least uh, that this cannot be uh, expected by means of law uh, and by, through the courts uh, from, from Shell. And that's also an issue about fundamental rights and what they mean and what they also mean uh, indeed for, uh, for companies these days. I will move to um, uh, the second part, and this is mainly just uh, a number of illustrations. Of course, I cannot tell you everything about all the 142 articles of the Constitution. Uh, I have already told a little bit about what, what is some of the important things in our Constitution, but I have a number of illustrations, and these uh, deal indeed with the different branches, the judiciary, but also parliament, um, and it's also things that we are still discussing, right, and that, that might change in the future, or at least um, uh, proposals are being made to do so. So the first of all, first uh, thing is the idea of proportional representation. In Article 53 of our Constitution, it is written that the members of both houses shall be elected by proportional representation within the limits to be laid down by Act of Parliament. Also, this is an example of the big sort of room and leeway the Constitution leaves for the lawmaker, right? If anything can be arranged by Act of Parliament, that means that uh, the, the lawmaker can make a law that further details what this constitutional provision means. But it must be proportional, right? And this is also the reason why we don't have any voting hurdles in the sense that any party that gets enough votes for a seat in parliament gets the seat in parliament. Other countries, such as Germany, have a threshold, a threshold that says you need at least 5%, and only if you have 5% of the votes, you can enter parliament. This means that there's a lot of parties in the end in the Netherlands. And the idea is that we're a country of minorities and that we have to have all these minorities in our parliament in order to make the best policies that reflect all our interests and uh, ideas. But it's, of course, sometimes questions in the sense that when you have, I think at, at the top we had around 20 parties, and beware, we have only 150 seats, right? Um, and that means that there's a lot of diffusion here and there, and that some parties, some uh, fractions in, in parliament um, don't have the, the people, don't have the means to also control the government, which is one of their main functions in a, a proper way it's also really hard to form a coalition when you have a lot of parties. And I'm not so sure, I think last week uh, uh, was again proof of that, that a system where you only have two or three big parties is necessarily better. Um, but we, we have the other extreme in the Netherlands and that's part uh, of, of our constitution. So that's also the reason why it's really hard to change this. And our current government wants to work with districts, right? And wants to also have part of the votes be determined by, I don't know, provincial or other districts, um, which means that within these districts, I guess uh, there will be a proposal uh, in order to change the system accordingly. But within these districts, you then might have a fight for the few seats that are, that are there and that might lead to bigger parties um, uh, coming together, right? Because if you only have a few seats in a certain district um, to, to share, uh, then it doesn't make sense, for example, to vote for the Partij voor de Dieren, the party for the animals, which is one of the smaller parties in our parliament. Um, also, the second uh, thing is, is interesting. Um, in Article 67, uh, paragraph 3, we read that the members shall not be bound by a mandate or instructions when casting their votes. Of course, fractions, political parties usually vote together. This is also expected, etc. But the Constitution says, no, it's not an obligation. That also means that if you do not want to follow your party line, they can kick you out, but you still keep your seat. 
And also that can sometimes lead to the fact that we even have more parties, right? Because you probably know examples if you're in the Netherlands for a bit longer uh, of, of people who left their party but stayed in, in parliament. Uh, and the idea behind it is, is historical, uh, that uh, before, when we still had the seven provinces, people in parliament did have to take into account, uh, it's called a lost, also in the Dutch version it says, you vote without lost, uh, without having uh, you know, a, something you, you carry on with you that you got from the province where you came from. Before, it was the idea that they would take the interest from their province to, to the parliament. Uh, but nowadays, uh, that's uh, not the case. It might add to uh, some issues also with coalition building, etc. So the king, so we're a constitutional monarchy, and the king is still everywhere in the constitution. You could even say that there's a number of ways in which uh, the king shows up. So... You know, on the one hand, as a natural person, and the first article is an example of that. So the title to the throne shall be hereditary and shall vest in the legitimate descendants of King William I, Prince of Orange Nassau. So then we're talking about a natural person that is allowed to take the throne in the Netherlands. So secondly, we have Article 42. The government consists of the king, and the minister. So the king is part of our government. However, paragraph two, and this was already the case in 1848, the ministers and not the king shall be responsible for acts of government. So whenever a law is signed, the king has to sign the law, but also a minister that is responsible for that law. And if you have a problem with that law, or if the parliament has questions about the law or how it's executed, then that's the minister they should be after. But also, if the king in his public function does things that are questionable, the minister can be called to parliament to give an explanation. For example, when the king, during the COVID pandemic, decided to fly to his vacation home in Greece, uh, that can be a reason uh, also to ask the minister what's uh, going on. And the third one, it's, it's a bit clearer in the Dutch version, because in the Dutch version often mention is made of a koninklijk besluit, a royal decree. And in this case, it's a royal decree that appoints the prime minister. And it is signed indeed by the king, but also by the uh, prime minister himself. And the prime minister and the king also sign it for the other Ministers, But often mention is made of the koninklijk besluit, and sometimes uh, this uh, leads to some confusion, right, in, in the, the public debate, because it's not, you know, a decision by the king. Maybe you remember that a couple of weeks back, uh, the Dutch government tried to create some emergency laws in order to depart from our immigration laws. Uh, it said there was a, a migration crisis and that that was reason to use an emergency option that would allow uh, to depart from, from the law. And there had to be a koninklijk besluit, a royal decree, to trigger this. But in that case, it would actually be the prime minister that would uh, take this koninklijk besluit. So it's not something about uh, the king himself. In fact, the role of the king, in case you start to worry, is pretty small. So he did have a role uh, until 2012 in the uh, creation of the government in the sense that after the elections he was the first, or she can also be a queen of course, that uh, gets to talk to all the uh, leaders of the uh, different parties. Uh, that was not in the constitution itself, but it was in the regulations of the, uh, uh, of the second chamber, and it has been removed. And now, uh, it is the case that uh, the parliament decides how the coalition uh, formation is, is going to start, and who is going to look for maybe parties that could work together uh, or not. So in the end, uh, it's uh, still quite 
only a symbolic role left. So very briefly, uh, but it is a central element of the Dutch constitution and of our state in the end. We are a constitutional monarchy, but we're also a decentralized unitary state. So it's not a federation or anything of that kind. We do have provinces and we do have municipalities, but we are a unitary state. And the House of Thorbecke is indeed the idea uh, that Thorbecke put in his constitution, 8048, that we have certain layers of government, right? And you must not really see those as hierarchical in nature, in the sense that the state is above the provinces and the municipalities. There, there's an image of this House of Thorbecke that has three pillars, right? Uh, the Rijk, the central state, uh, but also the municipalities and uh, the provinces. Um, and that's an important thing in the Netherlands. And the idea is that when possible, things should be arranged and regulated at the lowest level possible. So as close to the citizens as is possible. At the same time, um, you see that there is some power of the central state, of course, and that uh, uh, is also, uh, I, think, I think, necessary, right? If a state has also a lot of obligations, also under international law, of the state to uh, expect certain things from those other uh, governmental forms. So uh, this is the, the two uh, basic things we have. So on the one hand, there is a power of provinces and municipalities to regulate and administer their own internal affairs. For example, if you think about the Algemene Plaatselijke Verordening, uh, which is a, a general act uh, at the municipal level where uh, the basic things for the municipality are taken care of. Of course, this has to stay within the boundaries of higher laws, right, of, of national laws, uh, etc. But within this sphere, um, there is uh, some room to regulate. Uh, at the same time, there's also a possibility that um, municipal and provincial organs may be required by or pursuant to an act of parliament to provide regulation and administration. So there's also tasks that are developed at the national state level, but then come with tasks for uh, municipalities, for example. Think of the social domain. In 2015, we had a big transfer of some obligations from the central state to governments when it comes to uh, work and, and care, etc. But think also of the recent, uh, and I'm sorry for the non-Dutch who are not so involved in Dutch politics, but it's been a big issue, the spreidingswet, right? At the national level, it was considered that we need to spread uh, immigrants, asylum seekers entering the Netherlands more evenly over municipalities. And that has been a big debate. Can the central government request that? Or is it, is it up to municipalities? So in our constitution doesn't really have a clear cut division of what belongs to um, uh, the lower levels and what uh, actually is for the state to determine, uh, but it is uh, sort of decided on the go. And the final two uh, blocks are indeed about the courts and the uh, role of fundamental rights in our Dutch constitution, because I've mentioned it a few times, and I repeat it because it's, it's a central issue in our constitution. And I remember when I was uh, uh, studying in the US for a while that this was always something people found a bit strange, right? Because why do you have a constitution that is above normal laws, but you prohibit courts to see whether these laws are actually in line with the constitution? That's the whole idea of a constitution, right? That it has to be checked whether it's complied with. And who else should check this rather than a court? Well, in the Netherlands, and this has to do with the fact that we have this old constitution that was back then, and indeed therefore still is, based on the idea that if there is maybe different interpretations of the constitution possible, if you can argue 
whether a law is or is not in line with the constitution, then we prefer the parliament to say whether it's the case or not. And it's for the parliament to decide rather than for the courts. Why? Because the parliament is the people we voted for and we didn't elect judges. So again, our constitution is more political than judicial, right? It has some aspects of parliamentary sovereignty, like, you know, it may be from the United Kingdom. And it recognizes from the outset, I guess, that there can be differences of interpretation of the constitution, right? If the constitution says there is a freedom of uh, expression, but you can still sometimes limit that, um, it is not always easy for a court uh, to judge. So that's the basic idea behind it. However, we have this article 120. It's a bit difficult to read, right? But actually, that, that's what it says. The constitutionality of acts of parliament and also of international treaties, but I leave that aside for now, shall not be reviewed by the courts. Before, before 1983, it was phrased something like uh, laws are... Onschendbaar, I mean, untouchable. You cannot touch formal laws made by, by parliament. Um, however, our constitution at the same time is quite open to international developments and international norms. And this can be seen in articles 93 and 94 of the constitution. And the point is a little bit that because we have this openness to international norms, this prohibition of constitutional review seems to be useless, a bit outdated, and a bit, I don't know, uh, not really in line with this openness. Because what Article 93 and 94 mean, I will summarize it in, in a bit more uh, simple way, is that if there are norms in international treaties to which the Netherlands is party, for example, the European Convention on Human Rights, and these norms are clear enough so that they can function in our legal order, without having to be transposed or, or changed or uh, uh, needing uh, legislative uh, uh, details, then courts can review whether acts are in line with these treaty norms. So very simple, if you have the freedom of expression, of religion, of uh, personal life, of family life, etc., and you think that a law is in violation of one of these rights, you cannot say, please, court, check whether this is in line with the Constitution, but you can say, you know, these rights are also in the European Convention on Human Rights, or these rights are also in another treaty, so please, court, check whether they're in line with that norm. So that's why the fundamental rights catalogs in these treaties, and most importantly, indeed, the European Convention on Human Rights, not part of the EU, part of the Council of Europe, which is an international organization, 46 uh, member states. That means that that fundamental rights catalog has taken over part of the role a constitution plays uh, in, uh, in a lot of other countries. Uh, and that's why we often also as lawyers uh, refer to the European Convention rather than to the constitution. And we have case law, we have judgments based on the convention. And an important example Maybe the image is, is not entirely clear, but some of you might remember that a couple of years back, Urgenda won from the state, even at the Supreme Court. I think that's when this picture was taken, Marianne Minisma of Stichting Urgenda. And the claim Urgenda made was that the Dutch state was not doing enough in order to protect rights to life and rights to private life when it came to combating climate change. And the court indeed reviewed what the state did and didn't do on the basis of the norms of the European Convention. And that's where we got our landmark case from, right? Because this case has been influential throughout the world, but it had nothing to do with our constitution. Now, we are also, um, it's my final uh, uh, example. We are, of course, discussing to change the uh, 
Article 120, right? And to allow for constitutional review. Because it's a bit nonsensical to not review on the basis of the Constitution when you use other norms. Some people say, well, the legal additional benefit is very limited, so pff, just leave it like this. Others say, yeah, but you know, we also want our Constitution to be important and to be alive and something courts can work with, etc. cetera. Uh, so the previous government actually created quite a detailed plan which courts can look at the Constitution, what provisions of the Constitution can allow for review, how do we want to uh, uh, create uh, the, the, the procedure. Um, and also our current government uh, has in its program that it wants to allow for constitutional review and that it wants to create a constitutional court that can uh, do this constitutional review. So this is also a big uh, issue of debate, maybe uh, you uh, afterwards have a question about that, but there, there's one thing I want to uh, end with, and that has to do with the way the fundamental rights in our Constitution are formulated. Because you could argue that even if courts could see whether laws are in line with the Constitution, there wouldn't be that much for them to review. And, and the point is as follows. So our fundamental rights, to put it simply, leave quite a lot of room for the legislator to limit these rights. And the requirements it sets, because that, that's, that's quite normal, right? A lot of fundamental rights can be limited. But a lot of constitutions and international documents then require that these limitations be proportional or reasonable, or not go further than, than, than is necessary, right? If you would make a rule that, that uh, allows us to, now that requires us to wear a face mask tomorrow, that would not be proportional, right? That, that's, that's a too big infringement on our freedom because there's no justification currently, I guess, for doing so. But our constitution doesn't require proportionality. It only requires that limitations of fundamental rights are based on acts of parliament. As long as the people we voted for agree with it, they can sort of do whatever they want, right? The right of assembly and demonstration shall be recognized. Well, that's great, we have this right without prejudice to the responsibility of everyone under the law. That, that's phrased a bit um, unclear. In Dutch, it would be behoudens ieders verantwoordelijkheid voor de wet, meaning you can make a law that says, yes, you have the right to demonstrate, but not in this, that and that case. And so, of course, you cannot do everything, but indeed we have a law, the... Uh, Wet, now I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with my Dutch, uh, the Wet Openbare Manifestaties that allows for a mayor, right? We know the examples from the news, to maybe prohibit a demonstration or regulate it or stop it when things get out of hand. And of course, you cannot do anything, right? Everything. You, you cannot prohibit a demonstration just because of what it's about and on the basis of the content of this demonstration. But there are laws that allow then for limiting certain rights. Uh, and indeed, right, rules to protect health in the interest of traffic and to combat or prevent disorders may be laid down by act of parliament. But this does not, the right as formulated in the constitution itself does not require uh, that these limitations must be proportional. So if a court, uh, wants to judge whether this act limiting the constitutional right to demonstrate is justified or not, it can merely look, right, whether it was in there, the, the limitation, whether the limitation indeed was laid down in this act of parliament. Uh, the same for Article 10. Everyone shall have the right to respect his privacy without prejudice to restrictions laid down by or pursuant to Act of Parliament. So 
So there can be limitations. They must be based on, uh, on acts of, of parliament. And also the social rights in our constitution, these are uh, generally phrased in a more indirect way, right? The constitution does not say everyone has a right to housing, everyone has a right to health care, and everyone has a right to uh, work. But it does phrase kind of an obligation for governments to take steps. The authorities shall take steps to promote the health of the population. So also this is not really a very detailed basis for a court to actually judge whether laws are or are not in line with the constitution. And it shall be the concern of the authorities to provide sufficient living conditions. Uh, or the third paragraph, the authority shall promote social and cultural development and leisure activities. Um, I'm not sure uh, how about you, but I could go to court tomorrow and ask for some more free time because it's my constitutional right, but the court is not really able to work with that, right? So my point is not, um, and I will conclude, that we then should just forget about constitutional review because our constitution is too vague or at least too much room for parliament. But I think we should be aware of that, right? And also in our political and public debates, we must be aware of the fact that constitutional rights, first of all, must be sometimes limited, right? That we cannot always guarantee every fundamental right uh, in its entirety, also because these rights often conflict and because there can be situations, uh, whether it has to do with the right to, to demonstrate uh, uh, or the right to private life, um, I think also of, of situations such as a pandemic that rights need, need to be limited. So that's good to know, but it's also good to know that our constitution doesn't indeed provide some kind of a watertight guarantee um, uh, against uh, governments and against uh, lawmakers uh, that want to change our guarantees or change our rights. And that if we move to constitutional review, which I would um, uh, be in favor of, my argument would be as a scholar that we should also change some of the formulations of, this, um, uh, of these fundamental rights. And that indeed they need not only be based on acts of parliament, but should at all times also be proportional to the aims that a legislator uh, wants to achieve with them. So that was, I guess, my um, brief uh, walk through the Dutch constitution. So this image, this is Mark Rutte, for those of you who have not been in the Netherlands long enough. Um, I chose this image simply because probably he's waving, so it, it looks like uh, something uh, of an ending, but also indeed maybe to make again the point that that's what the constitution is for, right? To regulate power, to regulate the transfer of power, uh, and to provide uh, at least some limitations there too. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, lecture and the information. Uh, I'm not legally educated, but uh, my question is there is many articles in the constitution and is there a way of telling what article is more powerful than another article? For example, uh, prohibition of uh, 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 discrimination versus freedom of speech of, or freedom of religion? That's my question. Thanks. That's uh, an important question. And um, it's also a question I get more often, right? Is there a hierarchy, uh, particularly between fundamental rights, so that we know from the outset whether it's rather the freedom of expression or the freedom of religion that prevails? The answer is no. Um, which right prevails? And of course, they can conflict, right? And they can conflict in uh, concrete circumstances. And then the circumstances have to determine which of these prevails in uh, a given uh, context. And that's, in the end, uh, indeed often for a court to determine, right? Uh, if uh, a journalist makes some remarks in a newspaper that interfere with someone else's private life, uh, and then uh, the, the, the person goes to court and they, they fight about it, um, then there's a number of 
criteria that have been developed in the case law that can help make a decision in that context. But it's not always that easy, right? Because, for example, during the pandemic, we also had conflicts between rights to health and rights to life, and on the other hand, rights to private life and to be able to do and go uh, what and uh, where we want. Uh, and now in that case, it's also not so easy for a court to, in hindsight, say, well, that right should have prevailed or uh, this would have been the ideal solution. And again, then uh, there is, and that's what I'm saying more often, there is also a guarantee in the fact that these difficult weighing of interests and, and weighing of rights in the concrete circumstances, that this is done at least by the, the ones we democratically elected. Um, and uh, a court will in the end also judge whether the democratic decision on that point w went too far or was completely uh, uh, beside uh, the point. But first of all, it's the legislator that has to make some weighing of, of interest uh, when rights conflict, yes. Some other, yeah, there's a question. Oh, sorry, I'm stuck here, yeah. Thank you. Um, earlier you spoke about the unwritten norms. If I understand correctly, that also forms part of the constitutional context. Is that like a underlying unwritten value system that guides the constitution or the interpretation of the constitution? Thank you. Yes, great question again, uh, because I did want to say, but I didn't do so, uh, say a little bit more about uh, one of our famous unwritten rules, which is the, the rule of trust, uh, the Vertrauensregel. So yes, the, it, it, on the one hand, it can refer to more underlying norms, right? Maybe also a norm of proportionality that is not written into these fundamental rights, but that we do take into account when looking at them. Um, uh, but very concretely, uh, we have a rule that when a minister or uh, the government in its entirety loses the trust of the government, it has to step down. And this is not in the constitution, whereas it's one of our most fundamental parliamentary norms, right? Also, this trust in the government is presupposed, right? You have uh, a lot of countries where when there's a new government, uh, they should actually declare that they trust the new government. Uh, but in the Netherlands, it's assumed that this trust is there until there is a, a sign of, of distrust. Uh, and when the majority agrees uh, with that, uh, then the government has to step down. So that, that's one of our more famous unwritten rules. And sometimes people say, we should put that in the constitution, right? Just to make sure it's in there forever. Um, well, that first of all is difficult because then you would have to go through the lengthy procedure and that could lead to a lot of debate. And also indeed, then you might lose some of the flexibility that some of these norms yeah, do bring with them. And that can of course also be beneficial uh, from time to time. So we're almost out of time. Is there one more burning question? Yeah, I see. Not burning. Thank you. Um, I have a question about Article 142, where it states the Caribbean bodies. What, what does it say? <laughs> Article 142. 42, yes, where you mentioned the Caribbean body, and yeah. the article mentioned that you <laughs> specifically, yeah. And if that means the special municipalities since mm -hmm. 2010? Yeah. Yes, and if so, um, how could you explain to me that people that are born in those bodies are not eligible for their pension from their 15th birthday and are taken off 2% per year till 18, even born in those Caribbean bodies, which are part of the Dutch kingdom. Yeah. Thank you for, for the question. So this uh, indeed has to do with the Caribbean parts of our 
uh, kingdom, right? And also above this constitution, I didn't mention that, but we have the statute of the, well, it's a charter, I think, in the English translation, the charter for the kingdom of the Netherlands. And Article 132 means that the articles of the constitution must be brought also in line with this charter. I'm, I'm afraid that I, I won't have an answer to your more detailed question, because, of course, this whole kingdom and all the questions it brings up uh, does lead to some inequalities and some things that are really hard to uh, explain, right? Also because the kingdom uh, often signs, for example, treaties, but then still they have different workings in different parts uh, of our kingdom and in different municipalities. I'm unfortunately not an expert on that topic, um, but I, I see your point that there is uh, room for clarification on, on certain points there, yes. Thank <music> you.